Corey, I don't think you knew it, but there was a celebrity up here on the stage with the children. Did you see Kaysen wearing those cool shades? Yeah. Yeah. We got celebrities in our midst. When was the last time, uh, Corey asked you, uh, we started this morning, when was the last time you got into a conversation with a stranger? What, what was it about? How did it go? Um, I almost never talk with um, cashiers, because usually, I'm uh, anxious to get out of the store. And standing in line with, you know, 12 or 15 items behind two or three people with cartloads of food, uh, all I want to do is escape. So I, I'm not too good at that. But on the other hand, I always talk with Uber drivers and Lyft drivers because it keeps me from focusing on their driving and what I am sure will be our impending deaths. But I say things like, you know, where are you from? How, how long have you lived here? How did you end up working for Uber? A lot of students work for those uh, uh, car services. It's not... Uh, earth-shattering or life-changing, but I, I do wonder how much people hear a word of interest about their lives. And you never know when something you say will land in their heart and they will hear some good news some life-giving water in the middle of their parched day. More deeply, however, conversations, real and honest conversations, where we take time to get to know someone past the outward appearances, past the assumptions we make on the surface. Those kinds of conversations are pretty rare today, I think. A stranger who crosses our path um, is immediately categorized as female or male or old or young or gay or straight, of a different skin color or language, of a, of a different place of origin or religion or educated or uneducated. And it, too many times, y y the conversation never even gets started. And we cannot open our eyes to the possibility of, you know, for example, a liberal evangelical or a Republican person of color or an open-minded retiree and a patriotic Muslim, or a feminist who lets men open the doors for her. I mean, I could go on and on and on. We think of these things as oxymorons, but they're just people. In a way, the beginning of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well begins kind of with a comedy of errors and misunderstandings. And we're going to listen again now to the Word of God from John 4, 11 through 15. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, 
The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Assumptions and misunderstandings abound in the Gospel of John. Right before this encounter, in chapter 3, um, he's had a conversation with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus doesn't understand, you know, what it means to be born again. He interprets it differently than Jesus. And a little bit later, the disciples misunderstand Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman. They said they were confused, but they were afraid to say anything. And the woman herself, the Samaritan woman, misunderstands Jesus' request for water on two different levels. One, that a Jewish man would ever be talking to a Samaritan woman which did not compute in her head, and the kind of water he spoke of, this living water, was not literal water. And her question says, who does this guy think he is? Jacob? She, I guess, you know, it, it sounds like she thinks he's arrogant. <laughs> she takes him literally, and she isn't afraid to let him know it. She's going to come back at him, you know, with her own um, remarks. In John 3, 9, uh, Nicodemus, as I've pointed out, he also asks a question about being born again. He says, how can these things be? But in his case, unlike the woman, he doesn't pursue the conversation further or try to understand what Jesus is getting at. At its most basic level, prayer is a conversation. You know, maybe it shouldn't be a surprise to us that prayer is not so common in public places and maybe even in your own life because we're so unused to having conversations. The conversation that Jesus has with this woman is the longest conversation by Jesus which is recorded in Scripture. That alone, to me, signals that attention must be paid. Something great is going on here. Something important is being revealed in this conversation. There's a lot of evidence in Scripture that far from being a matter of shame or embarrassment... Misunderstanding and honest conversation is the beginning of a faith journey. Knowing Jesus requires having a relationship with Jesus. And my friends, a relationship is a two-way street. A relationship with Jesus requires responding to his invitation one that is made repeatedly throughout the gospel. Come and see. No wonder Jesus engages in and insists on conversation. It's the beginning of the faith journey. Believing, which is very important in the gospel of John, believing in John's gospel is synonymous with a relationship. It's important that his relationship, his revelation of who he is to the woman and her realization of who he can be for her life happens in conversation. 
Their conversation is emblematic of what a true relationship feels like or sounds like. Or, and you know that with your most intimate partners. The relationship involves mutuality, reciprocity, and regard, equal regard. And that's our model for prayer. I'm going to share with you just five brief things that we can say about the conversation that we will learn from Jesus and the woman at the well and the importance of that conversation for prayer. First, note that the conversation begins with mutual vulnerability. Jesus initiates it. He says, I'm thirsty. Will you give me a drink? And she also needs the water that only Jesus can provide. That's where truthful conversations start, isn't it? With mutual vulnerability, being honest. A space that recognizes that each person in the conversation risks being known and seen. How many times do we try in our conversations and in our encounters and interactions, how many times do we purposely hide who we are? Theological conversations begin with this honesty, this revelation God revealed to us and us responding to God. This is a fundamental characteristic of God to make God's self known, to take the initiative to reach out. God making God's self known was risky. To make oneself known to the other is to be vulnerable. And my friends, it is a holy act. An act of true love. Second, besides vulnerability, the questions are crucial to the conversation. Not questions that have predetermined answers, not test questions where you um, test somebody or give them a litmus test, not questions that are asked to feign, you know, manners, but questions that communicate curiosity, an interest in the other, a longing for information and understanding. The woman at the well is full of questions for Jesus, thoughtful questions, questions that matter and that lead Jesus to reveal who he really is. Jesus affirms questions. His teaching method is frequently to ask questions. God wants us to ask questions because it is questions that strengthen the relationship. And it keeps the conversation going forward. Anything that closes off conversation, anything that puts an end to it, is certainly not what God desires. So that leads me to the third thing I think we get out of this is that conversations for the sake of intentional and genuine interest in the other take time. Conversations, I mentioned this already, is the longest conversation that Jesus had 
recorded in Scripture. It takes a long time to get where it's going. They take time because there will be moments of misunderstanding. There will be times when you can't quite get it. The Samaritan woman is confused at first by Jesus' offer of living water. But unlike Nicodemus, she does not let that stop the conversation. It seems that God is willing to hang in there with her, to keep on listening to her questions, to keep on exposing God's heart so that it can be seen for the abundant love that it holds. Our conversations that we persist in shows regard, shows respect, shows love. God persists in love and in relationship as we commune and converse with God. The fourth thing, when it comes to having a conversation with Jesus or about Jesus, the thing you can expect is the unexpected. (laughs) You can expect to be surprised. That's what a revelation is. It's, It's an opening of the eyes. You can expect God to reveal something about God's self that you have never thought of before or never seen before. The unnamed woman at the well is the first one to whom God reveals his true identity. It comes a little bit later in the verses. Basically, the first I am in the Gospel of John. If you read through that Gospel, and gosh, you know, the deeper I get into uh, Scripture, the more I love the Gospel of John. And if you read into the Gospel, Jesus says in many places, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. And to this woman, he says, I am he. Not to the Jewish leaders, not to um, the disciples, but to her. This social, political outsider, and he says, I am he. This is whom God is for because God loves the world. The final characteristic of theological conversation is to anticipate being changed by the encounter. Maybe that's another reason we hesitate to have conversations, right? We don't want to (laughs) change, do we? We don't want to have our assumptions challenged or questioned. So yes, in a conversation, You can expect to be changed. The woman at the well goes goes from shamed to witness, from dismissed to disciple, from alone to being a sheep of God's own fold. Expect it to be changed. Jesus offers A relationship both to the Pharisees represented in Nicodemus and to nobodies represented in this woman. And obviously, God offers a relationship to us. I I have a little story I want to tell you about prayer. A man's daughter had asked uh, the local pastor to come and pray with her father, who was dying. And the pastor arrived, and she found this elderly gentleman lying on the bed with his head propped up 
on many pillows, and there was an empty chair right by his bed. And the pastor assumed that that chair was for her, that he had been informed that she was coming by to see him. And she says to the man, I guess you were expecting me. And, and he says, oh no, who are you? <laughs> I'm the new associate pastor at your church, the pastor replied. When I, when I saw the empty chair, I figured you knew I was going to show up. Oh yeah, the chair, the man says. Would you mind closing the door for a second? So the pastor shuts the door and the man continues. He says, I've never told anyone this, not even my daughter, but all of my life I have never known how to pray. At, at church I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but... It always went right over my head. I abandoned any attempt to pray, said the man. Until one day, several years ago, my best friend said to me, Jim, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. Sit down on a chair and place an empty chair in front of you. And in faith, see Jesus in the other chair. It's not spooky because he promised I'll be with you. And then just speak to Jesus and listen in the same way you're doing with me. So the man says, I tried it and I've liked it so much that I, I do it a couple hours a day. But I'm careful, he said. If my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me to the funny farm. And the pastor was deeply moved by the story and encouraged him to continue in this journey of a relationship with Jesus through prayer. And she prayed with him, and she returned to the church. A couple nights later, the daughter called to tell the pastor that her daddy had died that afternoon. The pastor said, did he seem to die in peace? And the daughter says, yes, I, I left the house around two o'clock and he called me over to his bedside first and told me one of his jokes, kissed me on the cheek and when I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something strange, the daughter said. In, fa in fact, beyond strange, it was kind of weird. Just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head on a chair beside the bed. And that's how I found him. The pastor had tears in her eyes as she told the daughter, Don't worry. Your father was just talking with his friend, Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to experience God's grace for yourself. And I really suspect you do. Start praying now. Begin the conversation. Go to God in prayer, and I'll uh, give you a suggested start. And then you can pick up and pray yourself. You can begin like this. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask. 
and our ignorance in asking. And then say, give to us now your grace. And then keep praying. You can take it from there. Amen.